Well, hey, everybody, I am so glad that you're here with us. So glad for those that are joining us online. I know sometimes it takes even more work than other times to be able to get here. And so I am hopeful today that your day is going to be blessed with sadness. If you were driving by and you noted on the sign that was out in front of church, these words, Jesus says, sadness is the new happiness. How many would be like inclined to drive on in to get some of that? You'd be like, what? And what emoji do you even put at the back of this? Do you put a happy emoji or a sad emoji at this? Now, the one thing that all of us have in common, those that are listening um, all across the country, world, is that we all desire happiness in our life. And we're all looking for it. We're all pursuing it. In fact, if you're to Google how to be happy, you're going to come up with 6,110,000,000 different results for that. Now, you'd think there has to be something in there, right, about how to find that. And I think it is so noteworthy that Jesus, in the very first recorded message that he teaches, he starts everything out with this how to be happy. He uses a word, makarios. And makarios, it meant a deep, deep happiness. It wasn't just this little, you know, like kind of the happy feelings we can get along, you know, or happy buzz that could come along, but it was that which actually would be a soul-satisfying happiness. Isn't that the happiness that you're looking for as well? I mean, that's what this entire series, Deep Happiness, is going to be flowing from. Interestingly enough, there's eight connecting pieces that Jesus is going to give us um, to be able to experience that, which he wants us, God wants us to be able to experience in our lives as well. Now, they're often referred to as the Beatitudes. They're found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 10. We've actually looked at them already today. And they start out with the word blessed, hence the name Beatitudes. It's a it, Latin word, it meant blessednesses. So it's like, here's how we're going to tie them all together. But we know Jesus' audience, when they heard that first word, makarios, they were hearing happy. Happy are the. And last week we looked at the first and the foundation to deep happiness. It's found in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 3. You may have put it on the um, home screen of your phone. And if so, it could be fresh in your mind right now. If the words are familiar to you, let's say the first beatitude together, if you know it. It started out, blessed are the poor in spirit for... Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, there's the kingdom of heaven. In other words, Jesus was saying this. He said, deep happiness flows from our realization that we really, 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 really need God. And on that foundation, he's ready now to put the next piece for us in place. And here, Matthew 5, verse number 4, Jesus says this. Now, he used the word blessed, which we know is happy. So um, let's read together Matthew 5, 4. Everybody, ready? Blessed are those who, for they will be, or we could say happy are those who mourn. Deep happiness is going to be connected to deep sadness in our life. Now, before we pray. Just so that you know, of all of the Beatitudes and all Jesus' teaching on happiness, for most people, this is the one that is most stepped away from. It is the least favorable. It is one that we really don't want to be connected to. And I'll tell you that that includes me as well. But to avoid this, to ignore this, it's going to be spiritually devastating. And in fact, it may be one of the greatest reasons why so many Christians and followers of Jesus today, deep happiness eludes them in their lives because of the immediate reaction that they have to it. So with that tension, real tension, 
in mind. Join me in this prayer. Jesus, we want to be open to what it is that you have to say. And more than that, you're working in our lives today through your Holy Spirit. Father, you have said emphatically, your desire for us is to be happy. And Jesus is showing us the way to it. And I pray that we will be able to experience it, each and every person, and to experiencing it in a very real, soul-satisfying way today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. When Jesus started out and began talking about blessed, we know that's makarios, he said those that mourn. And he chose a word that was an intensive word. In fact, of all of the words that deal with grieving, mourning, sorrow, nine different words he could have chosen from, he chose the word that was the most intense. He chose the word pantheo. Would you say it once with me? Pantheo. One more time. Pantheo. Pantheo meant it was a sorrow of the heart, a deep sorrow, one that you could feel in your gut, that couldn't help but to be expressed outwardly. A lot of times it would come with tears, but not always tears. Sometimes it was a groaning. Sometimes it was just a pained expression on the face that you couldn't miss. For a person who experienced pantheo, you don't have to wonder if it's happening or not. That's the intensity of it. So let's look at an example of it. And then two of the primary um, um, sources of it that we could find in our lives today. That's our, that's our goal for today. Um, starting out with an example, if you happen to have a Bible, I'm going to take us over to Luke chapter 7. We have an event in Jesus' life that we definitely can see pantheo taking place in. He starts out... When one of the Pharisees, religious leaders, if you're not familiar with them, invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. We'll pause here just for a second. Because when we think about going to somebody else's house for dinner, we get a mental picture in our mind, right, of pulling our chair up to the table, feet kind of tucked up underneath that way. That would not have been the way in Jesus' day. Tables were set there, and they had like an individual couch that you would be on with your head toward the table and then your feet pointed out, kind of like in a recliner um, type of position. Jesus goes on. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. She had a plan. And as she stood behind Jesus at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Now, you gotta, we got ugly crying going on right now. This was not in the plan. I mean, she was there for a purpose of anointing. Next thing she knows, she's uncontrollably weeping, and Jesus' feet are wet with her tears. She wipes them with her hair. She kisses them, his feet, and he pours perfume on them. And when the Pharisee, who invited Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who it is who's touching him. What kind of woman she is, that she is a, say it, sinner. Oh, yeah, she's a sinner. And then Jesus answered him, which I think is really interesting, because Simon didn't say anything. He thought it to himself, but Jesus answers him like, I know it's going through your mind. And he says, Simon, I've got something to tell you. Well, tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii. Think half a million dollars. The other owed 50, about 50,000. Neither of them had any money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. And Jesus goes, there you go. You judge correctly. Then he turned toward the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? Of all of the, of, of all of the things that happened that day, this is the one that I wish I would have been there to see. <laughs> hey, Simon, do you see this woman? Like the woman at my feet, the one who is uncontrollably crying here and the one that you are judging so harshly right now. Do you, do you see her? He's like, uh, well, yes, I do. He said, do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you didn't give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. She didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time, you didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time that I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put any oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my head. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love is shown. 
But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, here's the question. Who experienced Pantheo? It was who? It was the, the woman, right? I mean, she experienced Pantheo. Who didn't experience it? Simon didn't experience it, right? In fact, he'd been, you know, it's kind of a combative dinner that he invited Jesus into that way. What was the result of this woman's experiencing a pantheo? Her life was transformed. She received the gift of love. She received forgiveness. She was never the same. What was the result of Jesus being in Simon's house with no pantheo? With like nothing, right? But don't miss this, but it could have been. Simon could have had the same great gift that Jesus had given to this woman, but without the mourning for what was inside, there wasn't the result that took place. Two sources of pantheo that we find in our lives. The first source is going to be pantheo for our sin. Now, as soon as I say that, you know, pantheo for our sin, I'm just, you might be thinking, we're going to talk about sin? Like, ugh. And I want you to know, standing up here talking about sin, how I feel. Like, ugh. Like, this, this is not a fun thing to do. But, you know, um, quick test here. How many here have ever sinned? Can I just see your hands? I mean, you did like, okay, what that means is this. Every, every person here has, has chosen at some time to not do that which they knew God wanted them to do. Or we, choose, we chose to do that which we knew God didn't want us to do. We've all done that before. And we know that there's an effect for that. Paul said this, the wages of sin is death. Isaiah kind of brings it back to where we are today. When we sin... What takes place? Well, Isaiah told us this. He said, the trouble is that your sins cut you off from God. Because of sin, he has turned his face away from you and will not listen to you. When we sin, something happens. Now, there's two choices when we sin. One, we can agree with God about our sin, or two, we can choose to ignore it. What happens, what are the effects of sin? If you're taking any notes today, I would take a note over this right now, because this is like um, just one of the very, very important things, and a lot of times we don't understand what's actually happening and taking place. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 tells us this is how sin affects us in our lives. It starts out this way. Encourage each other daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be, get it, hardened by sin's deceitfulness. If you were to ask me, what are the effects of sin? One, it deceives. Two, it hardens, or we'll come back to the word desensitizes. Now, how does sin deceive? The deception of sin is this. It won't affect you. This has been the lie of the devil going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You can eat, you can eat of the fruit because it won't affect you. But it did. And every time we sin, something happens. There's an effect that it has on us. It's like it's a law of the universe. It's, it's the same as if, um, if we were to cut ourselves. If we're cut, what's going to happen every time we're cut? We're going to bleed, right? I mean, you don't have to wonder, am I going to bleed this time if I get cut? You get cut, you are going to bleed. If you sin, it is going to have an effect on you. But don't be deceived, because the deception is this. You can sin, it won't affect you. You can sin, and you can go on, and life's going to be just as good. The effect of sin, it's not going to be that bad for you. So what is the effect what is the thing that, you know, is actually taking place in our life? God tells us sin, it hardens or desensitizes us. It desensitizes us to itself. It desensitizes us to God. It desensitizes us to others. 
In other words, when I sin and ignore it, it is easier to sin in the same way and it not bother me nearly as much and continue on that way. When I sin, it seems, I'm desensitized to God, it seems that God is further and further and further away in my life. Now, he hasn't moved, but it just seems that way to us. And with relationships with others, well, it just seems like there's this wall, there's this distance that takes place within us. And it happens every single time to us. The Bible gives us an analogy. And it talks about sin with the analogy of leprosy. Now, one of the effects of leprosy is that it attacks the nerves of the body. That's all it does. Just, it just attacks the nerves. So you become desensitized. In Jesus' day, cooking was done over an open fire. So you're cooking over an open fire, you have leprosy, and you just, you go like, oh, food's done. You reach in, you grab the pan, you pull it out, and you're holding it there. And all of a sudden, you're just like going, something's burning. And people are looking at you and they're like, eyes are wide because they see the smoke coming from your hand. It's you. You're the one that's burning. And you go like, oh my. And you set the pan down and you look at your hand. There are blisters. There's blackened skin. You've got second and third degree burns there. But here's the deal. It doesn't hurt. You don't feel anything. So what do you do? You just keep on doing what you would normally do, right? You just, you just go on with life. You ignore it. And infection sets in and you lose a hand or you lose an arm or you lose your life just because you were desensitized. You didn't feel it anymore. And it always happens. Now, the other choice... Don't ignore it, but you can agree with God about it. One of the verses I find one of the most hope-filled verses for me is found in 1 John 1, verse number 9. It's written by an apostle by the name of John. He's one of Jesus' closest apostles. And he writes these words, and I think he does so almost with this tear that comes down in his cheek at this. He makes this notation. He said, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us, and it purifies from all unrighteousness. Now the word there, confess, is the word homo legia. And understanding homo legia, compound word, homo, same, legia, word, same word, agree with. So if we agree with God, understanding this has really become one of the most transformational truths in my life, in my life as a Christian. Because First, you know, first pass on confess, it just seems like, hey, if you just, you know, tell God, hey, sorry, here's what I did, then we're good to go. Maybe you grew up in a church, uh, you know, Catholic church, and you've gone to confession before, and you know what it's like to go into confession and come out of confession, and you know how the cycle just repeats itself, and it's in and out. It's like rinse and repeat, right? Or you maybe grew up in a Baptist church and uh, you would come down to the altar and you would make confession at that point. You know, kneel down, make confession, you go back and you kind of get involved in the same thing, you know, week after week. And it's like, really, what good does it do? Because yeah, I'm making the confession, but I'm just, you know, nothing's changing in my life. And it's because we haven't agreed with God. We talk about the what, but we won't come close to talking about the why. Here's an example, and the only reason I share this example is because I'm hopeful that it will help you, because I'm not proud of it. It's like, I don't want to go here, but in love, I think um, this is what God would have us to do. So, um, Denise and I have been married for, um, you know, like 42, 43 years right now, and there are on occasions that we will get into an argument and, uh, and just fight with each other. In those times um, when that's happened, she will say something to me that's usually true, but it hurt. It like, it cut. And in those times that she said something that was cutting to me, my response to her was to hurt her. I'll choose a word, I'll choose a phrase that will It'll hurt. 
Sometimes it's sarcasm. Sometimes it's reaching back into the past of stuff that's supposed to be forgiven to be able to throw that in their face that way. And you know you're successful when you can see the hurt in somebody else's eyes. And it's at that point that you have another choice. Go on or stop. Show love. In those times, I've just gone on because you hurt me. And because you hurt me, you're going to pay. I'm going to punish you. And the more that I go on that way, then the Spirit of God will convict me. Guy, this is wrong. This is not loving. And if you were to ask me then, God, can you quote for me Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 25 that says, Husbands, love your wife as Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. I could quote it for you like that. And you go like, do you believe that? And I said, I believe it, but I don't care. Well, what about your testimony for Jesus? What if somebody else walked in right now? What if they knew what was going on? And I'd say, I don't care because I care more about what I want than I care about my relationship with Jesus right now. And I can go on for hours or days with that, you know, just that, that punitiveness. And then if I gotta come to God, do you think it's good if I just come to God and go like, hey God, um, and I said some things to Denise I really shouldn't have, sorry. Oh, we're good, thank you. Have I agreed with God? Are you as uncomfortable as I am right now? I'm gonna agree with God. I have sidestepped it, I'm like, I'm not that bad. You know, there's no darkness in me. Till I come and say, God, it was more important to me to hurt the person I love than to show them love. It was more important to me to get what I wanted than to listen to you. Holy Spirit, I chose to grieve you and to live in that grieved, hardened state. I thought, I can sin, it's not gonna affect me, and it's affected so much in my life already. And here's where Pantheo comes in. God, I am so sorry. I'm not telling God anything he didn't already know, but I am agreeing with him. I am being honest in my soul. This is why I say this is the most transformational thing that's, um, you know, one of the most transformational things I've ever learned in Scripture. It's why I, I'll teach it everywhere. Because when we do this, that's when we receive forgiveness. And that's when relationships can be restored. This relationship, that relationship again. And that's just an argument. We could talk about, you know, why do we, you know, um, continue with pornography? Why do we choose to feed our lusts and we know we're, we're hardening, we're desensitizing ourselves to God. We're desensitizing ourselves to another, but for the pleasure of the moment, I'm willing to, you know, just, you know. All the phrases that come to my mind are not things you should say in church to God. Deceit, bitterness, I'm willing to hold on to a hurt that's been done against me rather than to give forgiveness and to allow forgiveness in my life. Why do I pursue the love of money? Because this is what's more important to me than anything else that way. But when we agree with God, when pantheo occurs, when we mourn, all of a sudden, we can experience makarios again. A deep happiness. In fact, look what the psalmist said. In fact, want to read it with me? Yeah. Happy are those whose sins are forgiven and whose wrongs are pardoned. I'll say it together. Ready? Happy are those whose sins are forgiven and whose wrongs are pardoned. And that's what God said. That's what I want for you. That's what the woman of Luke chapter 7 experienced in her life. And that's, and that's what Pantheo opens up for us. Now that's one of the sources of pantheo in our lives. This openness, not just the what, but the why. We've done, we've gone where we've gone. The other source, it comes out this way. It's by what breaks our heart. 
Jesus experienced pantheo, not over sin in his life, but over that which broke his heart. And in many different occasions in the scripture, we read of Jesus weeping. Don't think a tear just trickled down Jesus' face. Think a strong man who is sobbing over that which broke his heart. People that were far from God, people that were hurting in their lives. What is it that moves you? I mean, moves you deeply. It may cause you to weep. It just may cause you to have this anguish or this groaning in you. Maybe for you, it's to see children that are in starvation or in their grip of poverty. Maybe for you, it's people that um, have found themselves um, tied up in human trafficking or those that are you know, trapped in racism or there's an injustice that's occurred and taken place. Maybe for you, it's seeing people hurting. You wanna see another example? You know, kind of, if you were at the Waukesha Christmas parade, you saw Pantheo break out there when people saw other people and the tragedy that was going on and how people were dealing with one another's grief in their life. That was that Pantheo that was there. When we see brokenness in families, we see brokenness in marriage, we see people that are, you know, in addictions, people that are struggling with mental illness, and you look at that and you just kind of like, it just, it grabs you. And it may move you to tears or it just may double you over going, God, would you help them? Because so many times we would say, what is it that breaks your heart and breaks God's heart? And when those two pieces come together, you think about children without church. You think about people that are far from God. It caused Jesus to weep. And that pantheo, get this, pantheo not only invokes something within us, but it invokes us into an action. Pantheo is not just the feeling of mourning, but it is then the movement to be able to do something about it. And when we engage that way, that's when we see that comfort that Jesus talked about beginning to take place in our lives. You see, the word Jesus used for comfort, it's the word paracleta. Paracleta may ring a bell with some of you when you know that later Jesus is going to say, I am going to send a comforter to you when I leave. It is the Holy Spirit. He was called the paraclete. He is the comforter. It is that comfort that Jesus said you're going to have that comes through Pantheo or mourning that the Holy Spirit is going to be doing in your life. Because when your heart aligns with God's heart, that's when you experience Grace. That's when you experience his working in you, and that's when you begin to experience his working through you as well. That's a lot of stuff, right? So what do we do with this? Here's what I'm going to ask everybody to do. This week, if you were here last week, I'm going to ask you to grab your phone, if you would please, and use the QR code to be able to download the next of the Beatitudes and to put that on your phone. So get that loaded right onto your screensaver so that you'll read every time you open your phone up this week, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. What we're doing right now is we're just kind of talking about, this is the tip of the iceberg. But as you spend a little bit of time thinking about this, knowing what you know right now, just going like, God, how is my relationship with you today? Is there something that's affecting me in my life that would affect that relationship? Am I being honest with you or am I being deceived by sin? God, what is it that breaks my heart? What is it that breaks your heart? How can I make a difference? And that moves us into the second part. Now, the QR code can help us with this as well. But if you are moved to see children just come to know God, to know Jesus, then I think it'd be a great time right now to join with us in children's ministry. For you, it may be students, and you're, you see middle schoolers and high schoolers, and you're like, this is a really tough time in life. What do you do? You get involved. It may be that you care about those that were their addictions. And you want to, you know, participate and celebrate recovery. It could be, you know, you see the needs in the community. It's like, I would like to be, I'd like to be a difference maker in our community. You're going to be here for second Saturday at that point. Your heart just may break for people that are far from God. And you're willing to acknowledge right now, I've been pretty just unsensitive, desensitive. I really don't care that much about my neighbors or other people. But I'm going to do my best now. I'm going to start to bless those, my neighbors. I'm going to begin with prayer. I'm going to listen. I'm going to eat with them. I'm going to serve them. I'm going to share. Why? 
because this comforter that brings comfort, that brings resolution to that which we are mourning over is gonna be working in our lives. Don't just stop with the emotion. Let it move you to the place where you're going to experience that deep happiness that Jesus wants. Anyway, to find involvement, again, the QR code, it's a great tool. You can just click serve in there or even better, stop by next. Because next is like the QR code <laughs> with people. You can go in there and they're gonna just help you to figure out what's your next step in following Jesus? What's your next step in you know, finding the place that you could make a difference? We do those after um, services today, so you can stop by and um, you know, just spend a couple minutes in there that way. And before we come to communion, because I wanna bring us into that with this truth of Jesus today, I wanna bring us back to this truth. The gospel says this, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Jesus didn't die for sin in general. He died for sin and sinners, sins that have a face, a name, a date, and a place. That's what Jesus gave himself to be able to provide forgiveness for. And if you've never come to Jesus, we'll say like the woman in Luke 7, knowing, Jesus, I have sinned. I need forgiveness from you. I mean, your life may be more characteristic of the other one, Simon there. Didn't really think, didn't see himself as a sinner, saw himself as self-righteous. One receives what it is that Jesus has done. The other, unfortunately, misses out on that. And if you haven't trusted Jesus as your savior, Pantheo today, a true morning, I have sinned. And Jesus, I come to you, the only one that can help me with forgiveness for that. Jesus said, if you'll accept an invitation, then everything he done on the, he's done on the cross and his resurrection will be applied to you. And I want to invite you into that today. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for not ducking something that all of us would prefer we not talk about, but rather giving us a solution for that which we need most in our lives and bringing to us life and emerging from deep sadness, a deeper happiness. We pray that for everyone here. And for those that are ready, Jesus, as a sinner to come to you and say, I need what you have done on the cross, Jesus, and I wanna ask you for your forgiveness now. If that's your prayer, I wanna ask you if you would just to lift up a hand right now. If you're watching online, indicate that. And do that boldly saying, God, today, as best I understand, I am coming to Jesus for his forgiveness and to receive him as my savior. Yeah, just, you can wave at me if you want. Just hold that for a second. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your saving grace, Jesus. What you've done in so many of our lives before, what you're doing in these lives today. May they understand fully the love, the grace, and the blessing of your forgiveness in their life. Pray this in your name, Lord. And everybody in agreement said, amen.